Today in Integrated Rangeland Management, we're going to focus now on habitat selection. We've talked about diet selection. We've also talked about habitat requirements. If you put those two things together, you can start to talk about how animals decide where to live and graze and interact in the environment. So that's what the discussion will be today. The first thing to just ask is how do animals know? We know that animals have really well defined habitat preferences, but how do they know? How do they learn that? Well, the first thought is it may be part of its inherited because it is fairly consistent. And we know that there are some innate attributes that affect habitat selection. Um, I've looked at a lot of research, and one thing that we're pretty sure is animals are not born knowing what is good or bad habitat. They, they don't just hit the ground knowing how to assess and to determine that something is good or bad habitat. But they are born with some attributes that help them decide. The first uh, theory is called the neural template theory. That it's the idea that animals are born knowing what they feel like in appropriate habitat. So, so they just kind of go through the habitat and they look for areas that are pleasing. And usually they are pleasing to the animal because they're meeting the animal's demands. So actually what the animal is born with in this neural template theory is you know, they're born with certain requirements because of their body type, their body size, or physiology. And they are able to um, assess and relate their feeling in a habitat to the value of that habitat. So that's kind of this neural template that animals continue to go through the environment and they um, tend to like things that are appropriate for them because they have certain requirements. The next would be uh, this idea of habitat preparedness. Um, animals are able to identify and remember appropriate habitat. So they have these certain requirements that they've inherited, but they're also prepared to remember those relationships. So just as in diet selection, animals were prepared to link flavor to feedback, animals are probably prepared to, to link the, interact, the effects of living in a place with uh, a preference or um, a, a, an assessment of that habitat. And then, then finally, also related to this, is the morphological or physiological attributes that the animal is born with. These could restrict usable habitat or potential habitat, and they could determine how reinforcing or punishing a particular um, habitat is. So all of these things are related to the idea that animals are born with certain requirements, and they're born with base ways to assess habitat based on those requirements. It's not really important to remember all of these three different theories because they are pretty subtle in differences. The important thing is to remember that animals are born with certain requirements and certain abilities to use habitat, and they're born with the ability to link habitat to um, how well it meets their needs. Here's one of those, here's an example of how animals are born with certain abilities to use habitats. This was a study that was done in Montana by Derek Bailey and he looked at Hereford cattle versus Tarente cattle. Now Herefords grew up in the British Isles on some relatively uh, you know, moderate climates and pretty easy terrain. Tarentes grew up in the Alps, the French Alps I think, and um, they, they learned to use really steep country. So they and their predecessors always used really steep country. They have long legs, they're, you know, they're really built to use country and, and get up on, into the hills. And what Derek and his colleagues did was they put GPS collars on animals and they did this work in Haver, Montana. So there was a pretty good mountain right in the middle of this pasture. And on the left, you can see where the Herefords, the part of the landscape the Herefords used. They liked the area down by the creek on the left. And then they did go up the hills, but they liked the valleys. They liked the sort of level benchlands and valleys in the hills. On the right is the um, co the collars from the Tarente cattle, and you can see that they hardly ever used that area right down by the creek, and they used a lot of the really steeper country on those hills. And, and in fact, they used the steeper slopes, and not didn't hang out quite so much in the valleys as the um, as the Herefords. And this study uh, gave rise to this term of, of bottom dwelling animals. So the bottom dwelling animals in this case were the Herefords, and then the real hill climbers were the Tarente. And Derek has done a, a lot of research on this topic since then, has found that there's a pretty strong genetic basis, uh, not only for the physiology of the animal, but just their ability to use landscapes. So Tarantes um, evolved or were developed in areas with strong topographic features, and they're able to use those areas better than Herefords. <laughs>
Some other interesting research was done in New Mexico by Professor Winder, and uh, Dr. Winder uh, looked at cattle and what kinds, of, what parts of the landscapes they used compared uh, in relation to water sites, so um, windmills that had water at them. And he found that the Hereford and the, and the Angus, again, those British cattle, they stayed much closer to water. They seemed to have higher requirements, and uh, they uh, they couldn't store as much water, so they didn't travel very far from water. Whereas Brangus cattle, which are a cross of of, uh, of Angus and Brahma, they had the genetic ability to travel far from water. They could store water and they could travel far. So those animals uh, were found in different parts of the landscape based on the distance from water, and then that yielded in a situation where the Brangus actually consumed different foods in the Hereford and the Angus. And that was simply because there were different plants available far from water than close to water. So I, I mentioned when we were talking about habitat requirements that diet is a, is a requirement or food is a requirement that is part of habitat. So how does food, how do food preferences relate to habitat selection? I'm going to go and talk about habitat selection, but remember that one of the really important parts of a habitat attribute is food. Think about this. Uh, animals uh, look at habitat on a whole series of, of views, of levels. They're looking for individual plants. They're looking for feeding stations that have those plants. They're looking for patches of food and patches of cover. And then they're looking for plant communities that offer the patches they need. And then all putting all of that information together into what is the value of a landscape. So they might be looking for an individual plant. They might be looking for a patch of that plant, or they might be looking for a whole plant community. And it's really hard for us or for the livestock to, or the wildlife to separate their individual food requirements from their habitat requirements because food is an initial element of habitat. So let's go back to how animals know where to graze and what to do. Uh, I've already set the stage for saying that they learn how to do that. They learn through individual trial and error and with the help of others. And here's a picture of some of my friend's cattle walking across the, the creek. And this was in April, so this was the Grand Round River, and it was really cold. But these cattle knew what to do. They probably had learned what to do from an early life uh, age, and they were following their peers, and they had all the skills to cross this creek or this river, and I was not going to try it, and most livestock wouldn't, but these livestock had learned how to use this habitat. They had learned this habitat um, skill of crossing the river. When we think about learned, there's uh, some very unique ap aspects of what is learned behavior. Uh, one is uh, a, a situation called imprinting. There is a type of learning that occurs in a very short period, usually when animals are young, and what is learned is really um, strong. It, it's really remembered and really strongly withheld. An example in relation to habitat is salmon who are imprinted on the odor of their home stream. And as I mentioned in um, the, the term philopatry when we were talking about habitat requirements, this philopatry or this fidelity to the home stream is so strong in salmon that, that no other streams are considered acceptable breeding habitat. And it, it, that all goes back to this uh, fact that salmon have imprinted learned um, behavior. It is learned. They, they are learning things about the environment, but it's held so strongly that it seems almost genetic. It's really not malleable. So that's what imprinting is. It doesn't happen in a lot of animals, but explains some of the habitat fidelity that we see in some. Uh, social facilitation, just as we talked about that with diet selection, also happens in the case of habitats. And then finally, trial and error and animals individually interact with the environment and individually make decisions about what is positive or negative based on conditions or reinforcement. Uh, so social facilitation and learning, what is actually learned? Well, we do know that just as with diets, the most important model for animals is their mother. And young companions are also important. Peers or other young animals um, are also important. Uh, social models uh, whether it be peers or mother, they transfer really critical information about the hazards and resources in the environment. And those could be where food is, where water is, where cover is, or where there is risk from predators, or whether there is safety from predators. So in this picture, here's a sage grouse hen, and she's got her chicks all around her, and she's apparently showing them about the resources in that environment.
I'm going to show you next a really important social learning study where we uh, first started to think about how do cattle, in this case, learn appropriate habitat behavior. And this was work was done by Larry Howery and actually was done right here in Idaho. And Larry's goal in this research, um, along with Fred Provenza and Dave Belf, those were his professors, um, and, and Larry wanted to determine if offspring learned locations and habitat use from their mothers. Um, it seemed logical that they would, but we didn't have any evidence that they really learned their habitat use patterns from mother. The study was done in the Sawtooth National Forest in Idaho, and it was done on an allotment where some ranchers had noticed that, that there was a central ridge that went down the allotment, and it seemed that there was always one set of cattle that were on the Maxfield Creek side, and another set that were on the Thompson Creek side. And uh, because the Maxfield Creek had sort of a, uh, a broader riparian area, it was those animals that tended to hang out in the riparian area. So uh, Larry's job was to see if this was true, if there really were a set of cattle that hung out on one side or the other, and, and whether they were consistent uh, from year to year. So Larry's first study was just to um, put collars on cattle and see if Maxfield cows really stayed on the Maxfield side. So uh, these bars are observations of where the Maxfield cattle stayed on the Maxfield side, and 80% of the Maxfield cattle in 1990 were on the Maxfield side, and only 20, or less than, about 10% of the Thompson Creek cattle came over to the Maxfield side, apparently because they were over on the Thompson Creek side. So that happened from 90 and 91, so it's clear that what the ranchers were saying in this case was true. There was one set of cattle that stayed on the Maxfield side and one that stayed on one set stayed on the Thompson side. So the next question was could these cows pass this behavior on to their cats? So Larry did um, some rather difficult work where he collared the cows and calves and, and then he did those observation studies and then he cross fostered. So he had those cows from the Maxfield side and cows from the Thompson side and when they had calves Half of them got to keep their calves, and half of them got their calves switched in these cross-fostering experiments. So here's a gunny sack on the outside of a cow. Let's say this is a Thompson Creek cow. That calf is up from a Maxfield Creek side cow. And what happens when the calf was born, uh, they took the, uh, especially if you have two calves that are born about the same time, you can switch them by taking the, um, rubbing off all of the um, uterine, fluids and the birthing fluids from one and transferring them to that gunny sack, putting it on the other calf. And the mother uh, really thinks that that's her calf, so, so she'll take it and, and nurture it. And as soon as the, the calf starts drinking milk and starts smelling like the mother, then the mother accepts it. So it's not easy work. Uh, we, it's done with uh, lambs also, but it, uh, Larry was quite persistent and was able to get a set of calves that were cross-fostered onto mothers from the other side of the creek. And then he spent the rest of the couple of summers observing cows that were that had natural calves or cross fostered calves, and tried to see if the calves learned from their mother. So uh, what he was trying to see was it genetic? Would only natural calves inherit the diets, the habitat selection features of their mother, or was it learned? Would the cross fostered calves also learn? So let's first look at the natural born calves, and rather than spending a lot of graphs, I'll just do this in a pretty um, uh, conceptual way. The Max in, in 1990, the, the calves stayed with their mothers. So the Maxfield calves stayed on the Maxfield ca uh, side, and the Thompson calves stayed on the Thompson side because their mothers were there. Next year, when they were yearlings in 1991, they started hanging out with their peers, and they started going over the tops, the top of that hill. And the drought started. There was a drought that started in '91, and so those Maxfield calves, the Maxfield side was a little uh, less drought resistant. It didn't have as good a riparian area, deeper riparian area. So those Maxfield calves started exploring a little bit for more, and they started really exploring the landscape, and they started interacting with calves or young uh, animals from the Thompson side. In year two, the the drought got even stronger. So in year two, you'll see that the Thompson. Uh, young adults at this time, they were young heifers by now, they stayed home. They stayed in their area because it had pretty good riparian area, whereas the Maxfield animals for which their, their stream was not as um, resistant, they kept, they went further and further adrift and they started interacting more with those animals from the Thompson side. Three years when those animals became their own uh, cows and they started having calves of their own, they went back to the sides that they had come from.
So by 1993, the drought was broke and the animals went back to their homelands. There still was some interaction, a little more than, that, than what we had started with in the beginning, but um, they were pretty true to their home sites. So those are the natural calves. What about the cross foster calves? Did they go with their mothers that were raising them or with their genetic mothers? Well, to take a look at these graphs, really basically the same thing happened. The cross foster calves were influenced by their mothers that raised them, not by their genetic mothers. So it turns out that this habitat selection feature is passed on through learning. In 91, the calves stayed with their mothers. In 92, when they were young and the, the drought started, the Maxfield calves started arranging more far more widely. When the drought broke in 93, they sort of went back to their home countries, their home territories. So the bottom line is, in this case, uh, when you've got groups of cattle that are really quite similar, genetics is not important. What's important is what they learn from their mother. So mother and peers affect habitat. Mother was very important in, in helping those animal, animals have uh, fidelity to their home site, but peers were also important as those animals um, went from the Maxfield to the Thompson Creek side. So peers also became important. Um, it, the, and peers, uh, animals tend to prefer habitats in which they were raised. However, as they mature, they're increasingly influenced by peers. So it's not unlike humans. You know, we hang out with our parents when we're young. Of course, we need to for survival. And then when we become teenagers, we all start hanging around our peers, and our peers become very in important influences, uh, perhaps even more important than our parents at that point. Uh, but then for those of you who have, you know, gone through college, you'll find yourself continually getting back to the habits that you thought uh, you would avoid of your parents, and I find that every day I'm more and more like my parents and less and less like my peers. So peer, the peer influence is really in that middle of an animal's life, and then animals will tend to go back to the diets and the places that they raised in. So peers are especially important to help uh, animals explore new habitats, avoid hazards, and find new environments, um, but that that can be a waning force. Um, the work that Dr. Howery uh, did also showed that environmental change, such as drought, can influence habitat use, and that social learning can sometimes be maladaptive. Uh, there's some research that shows that you know animals can become so faithful to the site that they grew up in that, that they may not be able to explore and find habitats that might get them out of a situation when uh, resources become limited. All of this gave rise to the idea that, that maybe if we had, habit, had animals that had bad habitat use behavior, such as animals that used riparian areas and did not use uplands, maybe we could cull them out. And in fact, because um, animals pass what they learn on to their calves, we can call out the culprits, and we can change animal use of landscapes just by calling out animals that are, are, are do not have the, the desired habitat characteristics that we that we like. Um, my dad, when I was growing up, got really upset at a few cows that always broke through the fence, and would get over into the neighbor's yard, and, and that in the neighbor's area, and that was particularly problematic because it was in Montana and. And whenever we got had to get the cows cows back, it would cost we'd have to drive like 40 miles to go get them because we had to, it was just a long ways around. So Dad just would get really upset about this this habitat use feature of these animals that caused them to go over the fence and use this Montana range. Uh, well, one day he got really upset and he got those cows and instead of bringing them home, he took them to the sale. And and from that day forward, every time a, a cow got out and went to Montana, uh, he'd just take them to the sale. Well, you know, it didn't take very long. After just two sets of cattle that went to the sale, no cows ever ventured into Montana again. Not because they learned a lesson, but just because we'd taken out, we'd culled out the culprits. So you guys probably have examples in your own lives, but it, it really can be effective. It's great. Gary Larson always has some pretty good animal behavior um, uh, you know, diagrams, and here's one where the, the, we are making the transition to individual experience, not just the herd, but individuals, and here's a cow sitting on the line and he says, look, if it's electric, could I do this? And there's the rancher, the farmer with the electric uh, ready to put it on. So this this uh, cow is trying to uh, get away from the herd and pretty soon it's trial and error for that animal. Okay, remember that behavior depends on consequences and part of the consequences might be where your peers go, but a lot of it is individual. So behavior has consequences and causes us to respond. Positive consequences increase the behavior negative consequences or punishing consequences decrease the behavior.
So we've talked about these before in class, but think about how you might change the use of a habitat by increasing or decreasing the positive attributes of that habitat. Let's give you some examples. Uh, go back to this uh, diagram that we had for um, how animals select foods. They taste the food, they have some consequences. If the consequences are good, like the animal's satisfied, they have what we call satiety, they're satisfied, they get energy and nutrients. They form a preference for that food, and over time they seek that food or they might stay in habitats that have that food. Um, another, uh, you know, the opposite would be true if that animal tastes the food and it gets negative consequences, such as it feels ill or it's still hungry, then the animal could form an aversion to that food which would cause them to leave that habitat or avoid that habitat. So in this way, diet selection is driving habitat selection because of where animals seek and stay or where animals leave and avoid. Okay, but there's a whole lot more to a habitat than food. So let's take this model and expand it to a greater level. First, let's look at the, the preferences. Okay, in animals and environment, they will see, hear, feel, smell, and taste the environment. They'll taste the foods in the environment, they'll feel the, the climate, they'll have, there'll be certain smells, there'll be sounds and sights of that environment. Then there's some consequences to staying in that area, in that habitat. If those are positive, such as the animal's feeling secure, it's relaxed, it's, it's thermally neutral, it's thermally comfortable, it's reach satiety, in other words, its its stomach is full and it's got the energy and nutrients it needs. If all of those things happen, then the animal forms a preference for that habitat and, and they decide to stay there or they seek that habitat out, you know, later in, in their day or later in their environment. So there's attributes of environment, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling the environment, and then those are related to the consequences. And what we're measuring is where animals are staying or where they, they're going. The flip side is true of negative consequences. An animal see, hear, smells, feels, tastes an environment. There's consequences to that. If those consequences are fear, pain, weariness, heat, cold, hunger, illness, anything that makes the animal feel bad or uncomfortable, animals can form an aversion to that habitat and then they would avoid it and leave it. And it's the same is true for us. If you think of habitats that you like versus habitats you don't. So if you put both of those together, habitats that you prefer, that you want to be around, are usually, uh, you've got friends there, you feel secure there, oftentimes you, it's, it's where you eat or where you're not hungry anyways. Uh, the water is probably available, it's comfortable. Those would be places that you prefer. And when you're stressed out, those are the kind of places you want to go to. On the other hand, there's places you don't want to be, uh, places that are that make you tired and hungry and, 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 uh, and are afraid. I sometimes worry about some of the classes I have. They're pretty dingy classes and then I bring students in there late in the day and you're feeling hungry and you're upset because you haven't learned this material and the test is coming up and, and it could be cold and, and you might not even like all the people around you and uh, God forbid that you might feel insecure that someone's going to lash out at you. All of those things would make for a very hostile environment and would make it so that you wouldn't want to come back to class. So I do try to make the environment and classrooms comfortable because I, I do want it to be a place that that students want to be. Okay so let's think about those consequences. What are some of the positive? We mentioned a few of them but if you said a habitat had positive consequences what would those be? Well here's a list that I have. I think a, a positive consequences from a habitat might be things like a place that has a lot of preferred forages, a place that's thermally comfortable, it's easy to get to, a place that doesn't have a lot of predators or at least low risk to predators, a place with few pests, not a lot of um, biting insects, for example. And then, of course, a place where mother and peers are, um, because animals, at least herbivores, tend to be gregarious, so when mother and peers are there, that's a comforting thing. What would adverse environments look like for a grazing animal? Pretty much the opposite of those. A place that has inadequate forage, a place that's too hot, too cold, too windy to be comfortable. A place that's difficult to get to or difficult to traverse, so really steep hillsides or, or rocky uh, soils. A place that has predators, where predators have been seen. A place that has pests, such as biting insects. And then 
a place where there's no conspecifics. That word conspecifics means other members of your species. So a place where there's, there's no colleagues, friends, peers around can also be quite aversive. Um, I'm going to go into a, a kind of an interesting series of experiments that helped us think about what are those characteristics of the environment that really do make it beneficial or not. And there was a series of experiments that were done on Q consequence specificity. Now that's a kind of a mouthful, but all it means is that not all consequences are equal. We talked earlier in this class about the gut and the skin defense system, and now that's going to come into play in a different way. We do know that taste and odor of foods are related to nausea, and that is tied to food selection. So food preferences and aversions are based on the idea that taste and food are related to nausea, and that's called the gut defense system. The flip side of that is that sight, sound, and touch are related inherently to pain and pleasure, and that is tied to place selection. So animals can form place preferences and place aversions, places they want to be and places they want to avoid, and those that would be because of relationship to sight, sound, and touch, and how those characteristics are related to the pain or pleasure that an animal feels in an environment. Um, and that's part of the skin defense system. So remember we talked about the gut versus the skin defense system. Now let's talk more about that skin defense system. Also just wanted to note that odor is a weird um, feature. It's a, it's a weird uh, aspect of an environment because odor can be effective in food selection, but it's also effective in place selection. And think about this, uh, there are certain times you'll walk into a room and you'll smell something and it could be very um, desirable or aversive. Uh, when you sell your house, they say it's really great if you can have bed, if you can have bread baking, because the smell of fresh baked bread is just inherently desirable, and it makes the whole place seem better. So places that smell good or smell familiar, um, that's an attribute of preferred places. And then there's other things that smell bad, such as um, veterinary clinics have that often have that smell of iodine and you go into a veterinary clinic and man that smell just it, it just raises your senses and often is not in a positive way and, and you know for us as humans veterinary clinics might not be that aversive but I'm pretty sure your pet um, feels that when they go in and they smell that that smell that's unique to vet clinics and, and other places so smells are, are interesting because they're useful in food selection but also they're tied to um, habitat selection now here's this experiment that was called, uh, that's kind of casually called the bright noisy water experiment. It was really the first experiment that laid out this Q consequence specificity and it was done by Garcia and Coling way back in 1966. What Garcia and Coling did was they had some rats that were a little thirsty and they fed them water and you know how water is hanging upside down in a in rodents um, um, uh, pen and they just kind of lick that water from the bottle. And one kind of water was lemony. It was a tasty water. So it was a lemon flavored water. The other water, um, when the animal licked it, it was bright and noisy. So lights would flack, flash when the animal was licking the water, and then sort of a bell or a buzz would sound. So we had tasty water and bright, noisy water. The water was the same. It's just that one tasted like lemon, and the other had lights and sound that went off when the animal was licking the water. So that the animals got a chance to explore both of those um, types of water, and then uh, some of the animals had, there were two kinds of feedback. Um, they either became nauseous or they got electric shock. So when the animals had both of those kinds of water, they either became nauseous or they received electric shock while they were um, drinking the, the bottle. So what did the rats do in the future? Um, which, which foods did they, or which of those water bottles did they avoid or did they seek um, in the future? Well, the results are interesting. Um, in the before, on this graph on the before side, um, those are all equal. Animals had similar, they, uh, they, ate the, they ate the tasty water or the light noisy water, regardless of whether they had been, they were going to receive illness or going to receive shock. So before the illness or the shock, animals liked both water equally well. However, after those that received illness, in the after side here, they definitely avoided the tasty water and they preferred the light noisy water. The opposite is true of those who drank water and got electric shock. They avoided the light noisy water and they drank the tasty water, the, the lemony water, 
So the bottom line is that illness teaches rats to avoid tasty water, but not bright, noisy water. Shock teaches rats to avoid bright, noisy water, but not taste. In other words, smell and taste are related to illness inherently in the animal, and sight and sound are related to shock. So if you're trying to change where animals are, it's sight and sound that's important in that habitat. So if you change the sight and sound and the, and the skin defense system, the shock, you can change habitat um, selection. Whereas if you're trying to change diet selection, you really need to think of smell and taste and illness. So rats could easily associate smell and taste stimuli with gastrointestinal illness. That's a food aversion. They could easily um, uh, relate sight and sound stimuli to electric shock. That's a place aversion. Another friend of mine, Andrew Sibbles and Larry Howery, uh, did some work with cattle to see if cattle did the same things as rats do. So they had cattle, and this was in Tucson, uh, Arizona. The cattle were randomly assigned to one of four treatments. The first treatment uh, would receive electric shock as their feedback. The third treatment was sort of the unlucky treatment because they would receive both electric shock and lithium chloride, which made them ill. The second group would receive only the lithium chloride, and the fourth group received no kinds of feedback, no electric shock or no lithium chloride, depending on where they ate foods. So here's what that looked like. Larry and, uh, and Andrus set up these experiments where they put food out in the, in the environment and they were trying to determine where animals would select food. First they had these traffic cones and inside of those traffic cones they had unsafe habitat because the traffic cones were a signal for unsafe habitat and however the food in the pens, those little round circles are um, a pen or our uh, food buckets. The food in those was a grain, so it was actually quite high quality. And here's what, uh, well, I'll show you a picture of what that looked like. But um, there was also an area outside of the traffic cones which would be safe. In other words, animals weren't going to get electroshock, and it had high quality food in it. And then there was finally an area that had a medium quality food that was a grass, hay. Um, it was safe in that there was no traffic cones around it, and the animal was not going to get shocked if it went in there. Um, but it was a lower quality food. So there were those three kinds of choices that the animals, they'd get into the pen, they could ch choose the high quality food that was safe because it was outside of the traffic cones, or they could choose high quality food inside the traffic cones, which was unsafe, and then also medium quality food, which was safe. So here's what that looked like. These are the traffic cones around a set of little black pans, that, and the pans had either the grain, which was high quality, or the or the um, grass. So what did animals prefer in those four groups? The controls, the ones that could go anywhere, eat anything and not get sick and not get any electric shock, they preferred grain to grass because two-thirds of their diet was either the green or the red, the high quality food, the grain, oh, but they also ate grass. The ones that had gotten sick when they ate grain definitely preferred any kind of food that um, was not grain. So they ate grass only. It didn't matter where they ate it, but they only ate grass. Um, and grass was only in that medium quality area uh, that was safe. There were no traffic cones around it. The animals that had gotten both electric shock and lithium chloride also ate the low quality food, and it turns out that that was only in the safe area. Uh, the animals that had gotten lithium chloride, I'm sorry, the animals that had gotten only the electric shock after going inside of the area with tra traffic cones, they avoided anything inside the area of the traffic cone. So they only liked safe habitats, and they would eat both grain and grass. So it's pretty clear that we can train animals to avoid places with electric shock, and we can avoid, uh, train animals to avoid foods with lithium chloride, and that almost never the two will meet that animals are really good at distinguishing between shock as related to habitat and illness as related to diets. Here's some ways that we use that. Um, we might want to train animals to go to certain habitats and we want to make those habitats desirable. So one of the things we often do is use water or supplement. In the upper left hand graph you can see that the further away from water the lower the utilization levels that we see on the range.
um, animals like to stay near water. Uh, it's easy for them. It's it's desirable kind of habitat. So as you get further from water, animals have to work harder, travel further, and we see u lower use of the range. Uh, many people will try to use these um, molasses supplements, dried molasses supplements. Uh, in this case, they're put in kind of a, a black barrel, a black metal or black plastic barrel. That's what the picture is showing there. And you could take those things and put them across the environment, assuming that you could make certain habitats more desirable because they had the supplement in them. And indeed, in this work by Derek Bailey and, uh, and Bob Welling and a few others, they found that animals would go over and eat at that, uh, that molasses block and that would make them feel good and while they were there they would take a few bites of food so they would eat more around the molasses block than far away from the molasses block and this uh, in some other aspects of this experiment they found that that was even more effective later in the summer when the grass became dormant and of course we know from this class that animals need nitrogen to digest and get energy out of dormant grasses so later in the year the use of molasses blocks to change distribution patterns can be really effective. So this is a tool then that we could create to change how animals use environments and what we're really changing is we're changing the consequences of being in that environment. So we can move a block up a hill and get animals to go up that hill and eat food around there because it's more desirable. We've changed the consequences. Another thing that is useful in changing habitat is um, using visual cues because one of the things we know is that animals need to need some cues to what is good and bad habitat just like animals smell food to see if it's a good food animals have to have some cues in the environment to see if it's a good habitat or not there's a lot of natural cues in the environment uh, the green strips around riparian areas are a sign that an, that animals could go there and and get uh, you know a good bite to eat in some water uh, th also real green areas on a far, far away on a landscape animals might be attracted to those because it would might be a sign that there is uh, some good forage there or trees large trees might be a sign that there's going to be shade available so natural visu visual cues are all over in the environment and animals automatically learn to associate them there's also quite a few man-made cues um, herders can be a sign that uh, that the animals are going to be taken to new forage they could be a sign of uh, of security that the herder will take care of the animals. Uh, when animals see the black um, black uh, remains after a fire, that's something they might remember and, and be attracted to in the future. Windmills is a good example. Uh, windmills in the southwest are associated with with water, so animals will look up on the landscape and look for a windmill, and they'll head to that for water. And then, of course, like in the exp those experiments by Larry Howery and Andrew Sibbles, they used artificial visual cues like traffic cones. Uh, Larry apparently had a friend in the traffic department, so he got a lot of traffic cones. But I've seen ranchers use this too. There was a rancher that was, uh, he's um, uh, uh, retired now, but he was out of the Cambridge Council area, and he used to want to get animals to come to supplement, so he created these wind chimes out of just old metal and stuff he had around. He'd welded into these kind of big elaborate wind chimes, and then when the wind would hit them, the, the cows would hear this sound and they would be drawn to the supplement so he could draw animals out of valleys and onto hillsides and he could move the supplement around then to use to move the cattle around and the only downside was that he was a little too good a welder and people started stealing the wind chimes because they were cool looking so so the cows liked them but humans did too so there's a lot of ways that we can use visual cues to change habitat use you're going to talk just a little bit about Spatial memory and visual cues. Um, cattle, sheep, goats, deer all have really good spatial memory. Compared, um, it's comparable to other mammals and birds. Uh, of course, we talked a little bit about in class about some birds have extremely good spatial, spatial memory, um, like nutcrackers. There's quite a bit of work done on Clark's nutcrackers. But cattle also have quite good spatial memory. They know where they've been. Uh, when you put animals out into into a pasture, if they've been there before, they know where the water is. They know where the resources are. You don't have to train them again. They know this and remember it. Uh, visual cues can enhance their spatial abilities. So when you put animals into brand new places, you could use spatial cues to help drive them around. And, of course, from year to year, areas that are green in the pasture or areas that provide shade could change, and animals pick up on that. 
So having that said that, how might you use visual cues or the things that you could do to draw animals to certain places? Not much work has been done on this, but I think you could draw animals up on hillsides by using things like flags, as long as there was a supplement or something there that made them feel better when they went up on that hillside. That might be good. You could also potentially uh, keep animals out of riparian areas with some sort of visual cue that was a, a sign that electricity or some other bad consequences were to follow. So pairing visual cues with consequences could be a way to use animals across the landscape. And it's, it's likely that that's the kind of question that we'll talk about in class or on an exam because I really want to see how people are thinking about how could you really tie those two things together and change where animals are in the environment. Uh, spatial memory has a couple different attributes, and, and like I said, I, we know that animals have good spatial memory. A uh, reference memory is a kind of spatial map. It's they have an idea of where the landscape is, you know, how the landscape is laid out, and that's something that they remember for from year to year to year is what the pasture looks like, what the landscape looks like. Um, but they also have this working memory. They remember what their recent activities were and how they interacted with the environment. So. Uh, in studies where they've put food in, in buckets and put them out in um, dry lots, just out in corrals, animals will quickly learn where the food is when they go out there, but they'll also remember where they've already eaten and, and where the food should not be there anymore. So animals can have this dynamic interaction of time and space where they have this working memory about what recent activities occurred in the environment and then also the reference memory. So by putting those two things together, again, we can change how animals use habitat. Uh, one last point I want to bring up is uh, this habitat use skills. Um, I don't know of any research on this, but I really believe that animals develop physical skills that could improve their use of landscapes. I've shown this picture before. This is of some cows um, up in Riggins Way, and there are some really steep canyon grasslands there. and and animals could really improve their ability to transver tra tra traverse that rough terrain and they could develop the ability to travel further from water and to use steeper, steeper ter territory much in the same way that any of us could learn to be better horseshoe players or better basketball players or better bikers or or runners or, or anything that requires some physical dexterity we can gain skill in it so animals could gain skill to use habitats um, they could um, learn, use steeper slopes in particular, and perhaps uh, they could get better at, at traveling far from water. So I, I don't know. I think sometimes we by accident train animals to use the habitats that we have. So here's the key points, key take home messages. We know um, that animal use of habitats is affected by a, few, a number of features. One, some things that are inherited. The species or the breed of the animal come with some inherited physical abilities of the animal that detect how they use that uh, determine how they use habitats we also know that habitat use is selected by is affected by social models mother is the most important social model but later in one in an animal's life when they're in youth uh, peers are also really social important social models and then finally there's a whole lot of ways that the individual experiences of an animal change the positive or negative consequences um, of the environment and animals keep track of that and they form preferences and aversions. We know that the type of consequent matter, consequence matters. Sight and sound and smell are related to pain, comfort, and distress. That is a part of the skin defense system which affects space or, or place selection. And then finally, we need to think about how we as managers could change the consequences of habitat uh, use. So again, I uh, recommend that you go to behave.net. There's uh, quite a few good uh, videos and resources on how animals use habitat. And I'm going to include most of the references that I had in this presentation uh, in hopes that you'll uh, continue to look at how animals use habitat and the science behind that. And with that, we're going to move out of these principles of diet selection and habitat selection in the next section of class. Uh, we're going to work on how to uh, use those principles to change what animals eat, where they eat, and how they impact the environment.